Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome on this beautiful spring day. Um, my name is Tammy Silverman, and I have the honor of serving as the president and CEO of Indiana Youth Institute. It is a just pure delight and honor and joy to be back in Muncie for our fifth annual State of the Child presentation. So thank you, Muncie, for welcoming us so warmly again this year. Um, we kicked off the State of the Child presentation this year at the State House, and I will tell you, uh, it was a great event. It's always a great event, but our team really looks forward to this particular event every year as well because you all show up so well. You're energized, you're, you're ready to go, and as we talk about today, one of the reasons that IYI um, leans into the State of the Child presentation is for the, is for the simple fact that we believe data should be used for action. Right? It's important that we know the facts. It's important that we track the facts. We're going to share a lot of that information with you today. We're also going to have it available for you to use throughout the year um, as you wish. But you all are already using data for action. And so today we're going to highlight how that's happening and how that shows up, both at the, at the systemic level and then how it's impacting real individuals right here in your community. So before we dive into the data, I wanna do some, some quick thank yous because this event takes a lot of planning and a lot of folks leaning in to help contribute. So first and foremost, I wanna thank the United Way um, and the heart of Indiana United Way. I wanna make sure I'm specific on that and Jenny Marsh, their CEO. So thank you, Jenny, and thank you, United Way. <laughs> Secondly, I want to thank the in, in totality, Ball State University, but particularly the Office of Community Engagement um, and the new Associate Vice President for Community Engagement, Kelly Huth. So thank you, Ball State. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to thank Julie Metzger because she is our IYI board member that has helped for each of these years. And I know that she's also one of those community leaders that leans into so many things in Muncie, so thank you so much, Julie. It's my understanding we're having a tiny bit of an issue with the live stream, so I know there are some folks that plan to join us live stream. If that comes on board, terrific. If not, we're gonna record it and have it available so they will not miss out. So if you have any colleagues or friends who are planning to join um, the live stream, please let them know that we'll follow up and make sure that recording is available. We do know that folks that were planning to join either in person or, or live stream, and we want to thank some of those folks. It's Delaware County Councilman William Hughes, Muncie, and I know Leanne's here, Muncie School District Director of Public Education and CEO Leanne Kwiatkowski, Anna Marie, the Interim President and Dean of the Teachers College, and Jennifer Mearns, Ball State's First Lady. So thank you all for being here and participating. <laughs> Last but not least, and then I promise we'll get to the data, is our IYI team. We have a large number of folks here today that are, that are not only integral in getting this event to happen and preparing all the data and the data book, but that are also going to be here for um, right after this, we are hosting a local clinic for, we are the TA um, provider for Lilly Endowment Strengthening Youth Programs grant opportunity. So if you're staying, please talk to us. Uh, but we have a whole bunch of team members that, that are here today that make this happen. In particular, I want to give a shout out to Dawn Huff and Jennifer Lombard. Dawn and Jennifer, you guys in the back, raise your hands. These are our... These are our local outreach managers. So we have a team embedded across the state because although we're a statewide entity, we wanna make sure that we actually live in community with you and that we're, that we're here to support you, as I said, not only at the State of the Child with our data, but also throughout the year. So if you don't already know Jennifer or Dawn, please get to know them while you're here. They will be happy to connect. And again, our goal is to support everything that everyone, every youth serving organization and individual that is working to increase child well-being at the local level, at the state level, and to a small extent at the national level. So with that, those are all of our welcomes and thank yous and, 
and I want to thank you all for being here. I know this is something of um, a little chunk out of your morning, but we guarantee you that you will walk away with some new information, hopefully a little spark of inspiration, and something that you can even do going forward. So as we start to look at the data, one of the things that I would, I would ask you to do, when we started compiling the data, and I'll introduce our two data experts in just a moment, we really saw a tremendous number of opportunities. There's opportunity in the data. If you're looking for what else do we need to understand about our kids? Where else do we need to lean in? What are we doing well that we can do more of? What aren't we doing that we need to think about? Opportunities abound. Opportunities abound. And the data can help guide us there. That data needs to be used, obviously, with your own expertise of what's happening with kids in your area. What are your programs currently doing? Again, that fits that bill of really accelerating and, and really lifting up the needs of our kids. And what aren't we currently doing that we need to be thinking about and talking about? So with that, I'm going to introduce our two, uh, I call them data experts. Uh, that's not their official titles. It's on the website. But they're also data enthusiasts. We love data at IYI, let me tell you. We believe that it can be part of that um, motivation to keep going, that motivation to drive for more. Because again, as we know what our kids need, and as we're very clear-eyed to what groups of kids we're really supporting well, and what groups of kids may we be leaving out that data can compel us forward. So with that, I would like to introduce Bree Yoon and Taylor Johnson, our two data experts and enthusiasts. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Silverman said, my name is Taylor Johnson. Um, and I think it's important, um, and I, Hopefully, most of you are familiar with IYI if you're here. If not, uh, the Indiana Youth Institute exists to improve the lives of all Indiana children. And I think you're going to see that throughout the data as we, as we go through, that we, as Dr. Silva mentioned, we are looking for opportunities so that we can provide community members and, and influential leaders in the communities the correct and appropriate data to make informed, educated decisions that are affecting the lives of children all throughout the state. Uh, the state of the child is six years, I believe, total running now, uh, and I know that this is our, our fifth one. Um, we think it's an important opportunity to understand the challenges that youth within our communities are facing. Indiana has a diverse array of communities throughout the state. We have a diverse population, and we're going to touch on that in just a little bit. Uh, again, we already talked about how important we feel that data is and accessing that data to be informed and understanding our communities. We want to empower you and inspire action. And we also want to make sure that we work together. Uh, the work that we do certainly cannot be done within the single, singular organization of IYI. We rely on all of our partners throughout the state to make sure that we're accomplishing the mission again of improving the lives of all Indiana children. It's important before we get into the specific data throughout the state and uh, specific to Delaware County to know who we're talking about. So Indiana is home to the 14th largest population of children nationally. Uh, there are 1.59 million children younger than the age of 18, and you see the breakdowns of race and ethnicity on the screen there. Children under 18 make up 23.6%. Nearly a quarter of Indiana's population is children under the age of 18. And so I think it makes sense that we spend a significant amount of time learning and thinking about how we can improve the lives of over a quarter of Indiana's population. This is the child population specific to Delaware County, which you see, again, by age and the breakdown of race and ethnicity. How many of you are familiar with the NEE Casey Foundation and the rankings they provide? Okay, so a, a good a mix. Uh, NEE Casey tracks, and, and IYI uh, as well, tracks a number of indicators that fall under four main domains. Family and community, health, economic well-being, and education. And there's a lot of indicators and data that feed into those domains and come up with these rankings. And any Casey provides rankings to show not only how Indiana is trending over time, but how we are comparing to other states when they compile these rankings. So you see that our overall ranking as a state is 28th. Our two uh, 
worst performing domains as family and community and health tied for 31st. We also see that economic well-being and education are 19th and 17th, again, in comparison to other states. Um, one thing that we've had a lot of internal discussions on is when you look at these numbers, especially our overall ranking, we think 28, kind of middle of the pack, but 25 is really middle of the pack. And I don't think anyone really is truly satisfied with Indiana being in the middle of the pack. I think we know, as, as again, Dr. Silverman talked about, there's a lot of opportunities for us to improve, to continue the work that we're doing in our communities and throughout the state, uh, to make sure that these rankings improve uh, and, and correspond with the work that we're doing. And so now, I would like to turn it over to Bree as we kind of dive into these domains, those four overarching domains, a little bit deeper. As my colleague Taylor just mentioned, Indiana's family and community domain ranks 31st. Here you see the four indicators Annie Casey Foundation uses to weigh that ranking respectfully. That being said, as I'm sure you all are aware, uh, we track well over 100 additional data indicators, a few of which we're gonna walk through together. Adverse childhood experiences, ACEs for short, are stressful or traumatic events occurring in a childhood that have long-term effects. ACEs highlight the potential impact of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. The CDC study identified an association between childhood trauma and negative later life outcomes such as poorer health, specifically speaking, obesity, diabetes, depression, suicidal ideation, STDs, heart disease, and stroke, certain risk behaviors like smoking, alcoholism, and drug use, and decreased life opportunities and academic achievement. ACEs are also compounding in nature. The presence of multiple traumatic events or situations over a child's life actually heightens the, the risk of health and opportunity obstacles. A child who has experienced four or more traumatic events is up to 12 times more likely to have the negative health outcomes I just mentioned. What does that look like for our youth here in Indiana? Well, for every five Hoosier children, two have experienced one or more ACEs, and of those two children, one have faced, one of them has faced multi, multiple compounding traumatic events, holding one of the highest occurrence rates in the Midwest. All right, I know there's a lot of text on this slide, so please bear with me. Compared to peers nationally, Hoosier youth have a higher prevalence across all nine ACEs as measured by the National Survey of Children's Health, a parent-reported survey, which is what you see here up here. I do want to note that, I, that these numbers are likely underreported. I say that in large part because the difference is reported in the 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Student Survey, where 38% of our high school students in Indiana reported they had lived with someone who was depressed, mentally ill, or suicidal. 29% of our high school students reported they had lived with someone who was having a problem with alcohol or drug, drug use. 18% of our high school students reported they have been or were currently separated from a parent or guardian because they went to jail, prison, or a detention center. 14% of our high school students in Indiana reported that a parent or other adult in their life most of the time or always swore at them, insulted them, or put them down. While it's undoubtedly important to recognize the impacts that ACEs have on our children, it's equally important to recognize that in many cases, these ACEs are preventable. The prevention of ACEs requires a holistic and community-based approach that provides adequate supports, resources, and protections to the youth who are most vulnerable in our communities. One of the many ways to ensure that youth and families have access to the necessary services needed to promote safe, stable, and nurturing environments is to continue the work in providing adequate and appropriate access to technology within the home. COVID redefined the way that we work and engage with the outside world. It also opened opportunity for students learning to expand while they're away from school. This transition has highlighted the importance of making technology accessible and available to our students. Research shows children lacking access to technology and internet will fall behind their peers. While the number of students did, that did not have access to a computer or household internet subscription slightly decreased in 2021, Indiana still falls behind the national average across every single 
grade level. Delaware County, however, holds averages below the state with the exception of students enrolled in higher education, which as you can see up here in blue, is over double the state average. School corporations have worked hard to address these heightened technology access gaps with creative and innovative solutions, ranging from community partnerships, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, even relying on public resources like local libraries. However, this places increased pressure on those school corporations to maintain these efforts. The need for more permanent, adequate internet access is necessary and vital to collaboration, advancement opportunities, and expanding learning outside the classroom walls. Perhaps among the greatest examples of the importance of technology in today's society is the role it serves in providing access to necessary health care. Telehealth has been and will continue to be an avenue to expand much needed health services to children and young adults throughout the state. Well, as Bree just mentioned, technology plays a crucial role in accessing telehealth care. Using available technology to expand health care into underserved areas is an important step in ensuring that all Hoosier children are healthy and cared for, thus working to improve some of the rankings that you see on the screen right now. Expanding healthcare access through services like telehealth is perhaps more important than ever. In primary care, mental health care, and dental care, we see that many of our counties, as, as a result, much of our state population, are underserved in all three areas. The ratio of, of health providers to population throughout the state confirms that Hoosiers are experiencing a shortage in accessing necessary healthcare. In all three areas of care, as a state, we fall behind the national average of provider ratios. Now, it's important to note that these ratios are not child-specific, but they are indicative of the care that children have access to within their communities. Delaware County is outperforming the state in all three areas and performing better than the national average within primary care and mental health care providers. However, these ratios show that not only are Indiana families and still some Delaware County families facing barriers in accessing healthcare, but that our, our healthcare professionals, our doctors, our nurses, our clinicians, the frontline workers in healthcare, these suggest that they're overwhelmed and overworked by the demand that they're facing. Now, whether it's specialty care to address a specific concern or preventative care and routine visits that our children in the state should have sufficient access and robust care as they grow up and develop. For parents and children living in these underserved communities, the unfortunate result is often foregoing care altogether. Of parents surveyed from 2020 to 2021, half of those who had to forego care for their child attributed the reason to not simply being able to get an appointment. 36% of parents indicated that cost was the primary factor in deciding not to receive or pursue care. Suggesting that even if they had access to the care where they lived, many simply couldn't afford it. Now, while not every child in Indiana currently has access to the medical care that they need for a variety of reasons, our schools should always be places of support and safe haven for children to receive not just education, but necessary care. Yet, as these ratios once again show, as a state, or even as a county, we currently do not meet any of the recommended ratios for student support services, like counselors, social workers, psychologists, and even school nurses. These ratios show that children in Indiana schools especially do not have access to social workers and psychologists who can provide valuable resources to provide the ability for students to process and cope with many of the problems that our students are facing. Throughout the state, we have four and a half times more students per psychologist and 11 times more students per social worker when we compare it to the recommended ratios. In Delaware County alone, there are 13 times more students per psychologist and 31 more times students than social workers. If children in Indiana families do not always have access to care within their communities, and they also face substantial barriers when they seek out services at the school, what effect must that have on their overall well-being and, and how they view the importance of their health? Unfortunately, the health care needs and shortages that we see today do not stop at the physical health of children, but they extend deeply 
into the mental health of Hoosier kids. Now, as we just touched on, students often rely on the staff within their schools to provide additional care and resources. And this remains true as schools and staff work to address the mental health of our children. In 2020, 86.3 of our schools throughout the state had a lead health education teacher that had received professional development on emotional and mental health within the last two years. I think this is a, a statistic that should be championed and celebrated because it shows that many of our schools have the resources available to address the mental health challenges that many of our children are facing. Immediately below that line, you'll see a yellow line that shows the percentage of schools in which teachers tried to increase efforts and student knowledge on suicide prevention. 62% of Indiana schools found it necessary and important to increase efforts and knowledge surrounding suicide prevention. And in typical data analytics fashion, the question should then be asked, what caused our schools to increase suicide prevention curriculum, knowledge, and, and suicide prevention efforts nearly three times over in just six years? Mental health issues and poor mental health in general certainly are not population specific. Every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, income, may and can experience a variety of mental health issues. However, the data does show that certain groups, particularly our, our black, Hispanic, and multiracial students, have poor mental health compared to that of their peers. The data represents the number of students who felt sad or hopeless every day for two or more weeks. That's the clinical definition of depression. On the screen, you see two sets of colored bars. The yellow bars show the state average, and the blue bars show the average of Region 5 of the Indiana Youth Survey, which includes Delaware County. Now, Region 5 is a grouping of 11 counties, again, of which Delaware County is included in that. Over a third of black, Hispanic, or other race students experience depression within a year of survey administration. More than a third of students in these groups, one out of every three, experience persistent sadness and hopelessness every day for at least two weeks. Instead of being filled with optimism and hope and wonder that should be prevalent in our children's lives. I think all of us know that the statistics that are on the screen right now are not simply numbers on a slide or percentages in a report. They represent our kids, our students, our community. And for many of these children, especially those who are unable to find the care that they need, the answer to their mental health problems in their mind is often suicide. We see the outcomes of untreated mental health in these grim data points surrounding suicide ideation. Again, the blue bars show the state averages and the yellow bars are specific to the Region 5 of the Indiana Youth Survey. And again, we see disparity in the numbers among Hispanic and other race students. In total, 18% of students in this 11 county region seriously contemplated taking their own life in 2022. 18%. That's just a few percentage points shy of one out of every five high school students considering suicide in 2022. 13% of high school students in Region 5 made a plan about how they would attempt their suicide. Over one out of every seven high school students in this region actively made a plan on how they would attempt to take their own life. And just as we saw the disparities arise in the prevalence of mental health issues, similar disparities present themselves again in suicide ideation numbers. Hispanic students in Region 5 in particular were more than 25% more likely to plan their suicide compared to any other tracked race on the survey. We also see that youth suicide ideation is not just a passing phase unique to one particular age group, but instead it extends across all grade levels. For each grade, with the exception of 12th grade, over 10% of the high school population, again, in Region 11, 5, actively made a plan to commit suicide. 
I've already highlighted the, the ethnic and racial disparities that we see when it comes to the mental health and, and suicide ideation that our children are experiencing. But there is another population that the data shows is perhaps even more marginalized when it comes to these topics. And that's our LGBTQ population. Across the board, from poor mental health, to depression, to attempting suicide, LGBTQ students more than double the rates compared to heterosexual students across the state. 80% of gay, lesbian, or bisexual students experienced depression in 2021. 65% considered attempting suicide. And 227 actually attempted to end their life. 22.7% of high school LGBTQ students with futures, with family, with promise, with value, attempted to kill themselves in 2021. And these are wide and deeply concerning gaps. And it's clear that many of our students in Indiana are experiencing declined mental health and suicidal thoughts. That, that data is clear. The data is also clear that students who are black, Hispanic, multiracial, and students who belong to the LGBTQ community are often experiencing these issues at much higher rates. The physical and mental health of all Hoosier children is dependent on our continued recognition of the opportunities that exist, and if addressed, will improve the well-being of children throughout the state and specifically in Delaware County. Children and families in Indiana today are struggling to find sufficient and affordable health care, often totally foregoing necessary medical visits because they are even able to get an appointment. And as we saw at the very top of this presentation, our health ranking is our lowest performing domain and has historically been so. The data paints a bleak but sharp picture. Many Indiana children do not have access to the health care they need and are suffering from poor mental health and untreated mental health conditions. And as we just saw in the slides we, we just went over, this far too often results in a cost that is not counted in economic terms, but is counted through the loss of a child's possibilities, their future, and far, far too often their life. If our children are unable to receive the care they need to live healthy lives, are not able to obtain the help that is necessary to face their mental health challenges, as shown by the data, how can they focus on their educational opportunities? If so much of their time and energy is being spent on worrying about how to cope with the stress that they're encountering daily, or even trying to determine where to turn for care that will enable them to live healthy lives, much less of their attention then is, is being dedicated to plotting their course, dreaming of their future, and learning foundational concepts that position our kids for success. We see again some of the core indicators that NEKC Foundation tracks within the education domain. And while we did see some slight improvement in these rankings in 2019, it's important to note that this data was pulled prior to COVID-19. The differences in proficiency between pre-COVID testing and post-COVID testing are dramatic. From 2019 to 2022, we see a 5.7% drop in iRead proficiency by students throughout the state. And iLearn presents a similar decline, both in, in ELA and math proficiency. They hovered around 48% in 2019, but declined by 6.7 and 8.4% respectively in 2022. Now these declines represent all students throughout the state. So to get a better picture of which students are meeting proficiency standards and which ones are struggling, we need to, again, get a better look by breaking out these groups by population and disaggregating them. This time series bar chart shows the percentage of iRead student proficiency that are, sorry, yes, specific populations achieved in iRead proficiency in 2019, 2021, and 2022. Now, there is one year missing. That would be 2020. I don't think I need to tell anyone why there was no test that year. Much like the data we saw in the health section, we see a disproportionate and elevated decline in proficiency among our black, Hispanic, multiracial, and our native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander students. Gauging I Learn ELA or English Language Arts proficiency, the data shows that already low percentages were made lower in 2021 and in 2022. Specifically, again, among our black, Hispanic, multiracial, 
Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander populations. In 2022, only 19% of Indiana's black students demonstrated proficiency in iLearn ELA, down from 25% in 2019. Within iLearn math testing, we see yet again, low proficiency scores made lower in 2022 across all populations, but exhibited to a greater degree within our racially diverse students. Hispanic students saw a decline of nearly 10% in math proficiency, and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander students saw a 17% drop in math proficiency. These iLearn and iRead scores suggest that many of our students are struggling to demonstrate proficiency and, and mastery of concepts, such as English language arts and math, beginning as early as third grade and continuing on into the eighth grade. Indiana schools are also simultaneously seeing a decline in our high school graduation rate and an incline in the state dropout rate. In fact, both our graduation rate and our dropout rate have reached their respective low points and high points when compared to the past 10 years of data. In 2022, our statewide graduation rate hit 86.6%. For Delaware County, the graduation rate was 84.5%. Now in raw numbers, both of those percentages roughly translate to about one out of every seven students in Indiana and Delaware County not graduating in 2022. If our students aren't sufficiently grasping concepts at a high school level, and a significant number of them are unable to meet graduation requirements, how can we expect them to be adequately prepared for post-secondary life? When it comes to college enrollment, the favorite data adage rings true. Correlation does not always equal causation. We cannot directly link the decline in high school graduation and the incline in dropout rates to the decline in college enrollment throughout the state. But there certainly are parallels that exist between those data points. Total college enrollment in the state declined to 53.4% in 2022, and many of the specific subpopulations in Delaware County on the screen right now track closely with the trends that we see statewide. Asian students continue to enroll in college at much higher rates, as do 21st century scholars and those graduating with honors diplomas. We continue to see a shift in college going rates among our male and female populations as females outpace their male counterparts. And throughout the state, we also see higher college going rates among those students who earned dual credit in high school. Now, while 21st century scholars in Delaware County continue to enroll in college at a rate of 83.8%, sorry, this is for the next slide, so let me revamp. The heat maps that you see on the screen show a breakdown of the 2026 cohort and the 2027 cohort. And again, in 2026, we want the bright red colors to be throughout the state. That shows a high percentage of 21st century scholar enrollment. As we move to the 2027 cohort, we see a little bit more of muted red, even some gray and white areas, which means that 21st century scholars enrollment has declined considerably in many, many counties and throughout the state. And now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. While 21st century scholars in Delaware County continue to enroll in college at a rate of 83.8%, the overall enrollment in 21st century scholars programming has been declining. And a similar trend is presenting Indiana's FAFSA filing rate. Compared to our neighboring states, our filing rate among students comes in last at 36.1%. Just over a third of high school seniors graduating this year completed a free application to possibly receive financial aid. Similar to college enrollment, Delaware County tracks closely to statewide FAFSA filing rates among all seniors and even among 21st century scholars. Through the decline of 21st century scholars and in FAFSA filing rates, Indiana students are leaving money on the table when it comes to continuing their education, whether that's a certificate, a two-year degree, or a four-year degree. In, in an increasingly globalized, complex, and an evolving economy and workforce, it's the hope that of every, nearly every Hoosier, I think, that the current and future generation of students are prepared for whatever form the economy takes on next. Every child in Indiana should be confident in their abilities and encouraged to pursue their aspirations and goals, being assured that the future they dream of is attainable here. 
Now, recognizing that these goals are different for every child and person, certainly the foundation of those ambitions should be built up and strengthened in high school and in post-secondary life. But they start much earlier than that. As a state, we have the opportunity to increase our students' preparedness for the future by expanding our investment in their education and continuing the investments that we are already doing as a state. And one of the ways that we can expand and continue our investment is in the accessibility and availability of early childhood care and education for all families, regardless of income. One in 10 Indiana households with children younger than six reported problems with childcare severe enough to have caused someone in the family to quit a job, not take a job, or greatly change their job in the past year. The high demand of care and insufficient supply of available spots has created an environment where too many families are forced to decide between choosing to pay for basic necessities or a quality program for their child. The estimated demand for early childhood care totals over 337,000 children five years or younger. This number represents the total number of children in households where all parents are in the workforce. Yet the total licensed capacity program only meets a little over half of that projected demand. How does this translate, right? Well, for every four estimated children in need of care, there are only two spots available, only one of which is actually in a high quality program. What does that look like for Delaware County? The estimated program need is nearly over 4,800 with a program capacity that meets three-fourths of that demand. Still, less than half of that program capacity is within a high-quality program. The Early Learning Access Index, or ELI for short, measures four factors, capacity, quality, affordability, and choice. The ELI score is based on a range from the lowest score of zero to the highest index score of 100. Although Indiana's statewide ELI score has improved from 60.6 in 2021 to 62.2 in 2022, no counties in Indiana were deemed to have adequate access. Delaware County actually held the eight, eighth highest ELI score coming in at 69. Despite the growing estimate and demand for care in Indiana, 25 counties actually saw a decline in the overall access score. Indiana, you ready for this? Indiana is one of 33 states where infant care is more expensive than college. I'll say it again. Indiana is one of 33 states where infant care is more expensive than college. Let's take a married couple family of four for an example. The average family size and household type in Indiana. This family has both an infant and a four-year-old. The average annual cost of center-based care for this family would be $23,690. A quarter, a quarter of the median household income for a married couple. What does that look like here in Delaware County? Well, for that same family of four, those parents would be spending more than the state average approximately $24,858 a year for center-based care. Nearly a third, a third of the median household income. Single mother families make up one in 10 of the households here in Delaware County. The same cost of care equates to over 90% of the median household income for a single mother in Delaware County. Throughout the pandemic, out-of-school programs both adapted and expanded the, their services to meet the changing needs of our families. While these programs play a vital role in the well-being of our students, too many children are being left out. Indiana has hit an all-time high in demand. For every one child enrolled in after school, three more are waiting for a program to become available to them. While parent satisfaction of their child's overall after-school program experience itself was an impressive 97%, parents in Indiana were more likely to report challenges accessing those programs. These barriers include lack of affordability, availability, safe transportation to and from, and unmet scheduling needs. 
Child Care Aware releases their annual national rankings in terms of affordability, not cost of care. In other words, the least affordable states for care have the highest prices relative to their specific median family income. According to the latest report, Indiana came in at 17th for center-based before and after school care. Illustrating the price of school age programs as a percentage of income in Indiana was higher than the majority of the other states. While this isn't ranked on a county level, as illustrated by the table that you see here, Delaware County's cost of care for school aged children falls in line with Indiana's high cost relative to the median family income. The data shows that early child care and education programs are just as important to the development of the child as they are to the communities throughout the state. The accessibility and availability to those programs within our local communities speaks to the gaps and opportunities that exist. Of course, we cannot ev evaluate the success of vulnerabilities of a community based on child care access alone. Assessing the individual factors affecting each community requires a much more comprehensive approach that involves looking at things like socioeconomic status, household makeup, or even a community's access to transportation. All of these more comprehensive indicators are actually measured by the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI for short. Now, as you can see right here, SVI ranks 16 social factors. These 16 factors not only comprise of one overall score, but also are grouped and ranked within four themed, um, four related themes that you, that you see here. Yep. Um, socioeconomic status encompasses poverty, unemployment, housing cost burden, educational attainment, and health insurance. Household characteristics is made up of senior and child populations, disability status, single parent households, and English language proficiency. Racial and ethnic minority status, and as the name indicates, it measures race and ethnic populations. And finally, housing type and transportation consists of multi-unit structures, mobile homes, crowding um, group quarters, and household vehicles. All right, so the higher the SVI score, the more socially vulnerable that community is. So how does that translate for here in uh, Delaware County? Well, Delaware County's overall SVI score is 0.824, or 82%. Um, that 82% of, basically shows that 82% of the counties in Indiana are less vulnerable. If you look at the household type and transportation in yellow, um, this, Delaware has a score of 0.835, or 83%. This signifies that just over 16% of the counties in Indiana are more vulnerable than Delaware County in relation to that specific theme. All right, so how is SVI typically used? Well, generally speaking, it's used as a tool for emergency response teams and public health officials to identify and support communities before, during, or after a public health emergency. But my friends, there is so much room for opportunity with it. And out of respect for time for our, one, uh, our other wonderful presenters, I want to spend just a brief moment talking about this opportunity. Uh, and sitting on the campus of my wife's alma mater, go Cardinals, um, it would be remiss of me not to be slightly professorial and, and challenge us all. Uh, every Brig professor that I've ever had always left the class with a lingering question to really spark that, that thought process in students. So when we look at those, those four kind of broad domains of the SVI, and Bree already talked about how that's traditionally been used, I think you'll notice some overlap in what we term social determinants of health. Now, social determinants of health is a, a phrase that's been used here relatively recently, probably within the past 10 years, and it's kind of picked up some steam. And it really is the determination of the quality of lives and the societies that we live in. And so instead of limiting our view of looking at the SVI, while it's important in planning for emergency uh, positions and, and possible natural disasters, I would encourage us all to look at SVI as an opportunity to look at how we can improve our communities now. Instead of waiting for, again, times of chaos and, and natural disasters and, and potential destruction in the communities, let us use the SVI to gauge where we can make investments to improve the lives of those leaving our communities now. We see an overlap. It's already being mapped. And so I would, again, in a slightly professorial fashion, leave you all with a question on how we can use things like social determinants of health to overlap and look at where are our communities more vulnerable and what opportunities do we have to increase. Uh, briefly, again, you have cards on your table if you cannot get the QR code on the screen. 
Our 2023 data book that includes all of this data and much, much, much more is available. I encourage you to check that out. We also have on the website, it lives there permanently, if you're just adverse to QR codes, uh, you can go to our website and under the data and research tab, you'll find it there. We also have county dashboards. So if the data book is this large singular snapshot of how the entire state is doing, county dashboards are these fluid, very granular look at counties all throughout the state. So again, a lot of the data that we went over lives on our dashboards. Uh, and you can even pull county by county, compare the counties, take a look and see how Delaware County is doing in addition to, again, comparable counties. And now, I would like to turn it over to our next presenter for Cradle to Career Muncie, or Tammy, who is going to. I was going to say this about Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, so the data, if the data tells us why, you know, why do we care? How many of you care? I mean, to me, that cost of, I raised two kids, the cost of pre-K versus college. My two are in college right now, and, and whew, it's a lot, right? But then to hear that, that's kind of the why. So now we're going to talk about the what. What is going on right here in your community? And to do that, it's my pleasure to introduce Courtney Zimmerman, who is uh, going to go walk through all of what's going on right now in your very own area. So Courtney. All right, you got me for a half an hour, so if you need to stand up and stretch, by all means, please do that. Um, so Cradle to Career Muncie, the future of our children and their community. Uh, my name is Courtney Zimmerman. I have the honor and privilege to be here representing my wonderful team at the George and Francis Ball Foundation and the board and the amazing individuals and organizations that are currently working together and collaboratively to make this happen. If you attended last year's uh, State of the Child's event, you had the opportunity to hear Dr. Leanne Kwiatkowski uh, present last year about Cradle to Career Muncie, and I'm just gonna be expanding on that information today. Um, you also heard from Zachariah Jones and his mother, Cookie Jones, last year, and Cookie's been engaged in Cradle to Career Muncie ever since last year's presentation, and she plays a critical role in the Cradle to Career leadership team and is also using her talents at Muncie Community Schools. Um, I also just want to stress that Cradle to Career Muncie is a collective impact strategy. This work would not be possible without the leadership and partnership of Muncie Community Schools, the 40 plus organizations, and 70 plus individuals who are already engaged in this work, uh, many of whom are sitting in this room today. So thank you for being here and thank you for your work. I'm also pleased to be here today to share about Cradle to Career Muncie because we need everybody involved in this movement. So how was Cradle to Career Muncie born? I'm gonna give you a kind of quick background, but just know Cradle to Career is, a, is an equity strategy. Uh, it's been a long process, and what we've learned along the way, most people in the community don't know. Um, I surely didn't, and I've lived here my entire life. Um, as many of you know, Muncie is a Rust Belt community. Used to be able to graduate from high school, get a great paying job at a local factory, uh, be able to support yourself and your family comfortably, and um, unfortunately, that's not the reality of today. Um, in addition, our community is different when you look at Muncie compared to Delaware County. And Indiana Youth Institute and the Annie E. Casey have done amazing work with collecting data for every county in the U.S., which is a huge resource. Um, using their data, uh, we've just expanded on their great work. And so research on cradle to career communities began in 2018 when Tom Kinghorn came on to the George and Francis Ball Foundation and Kelsey Harrington and I started in 2019. We started researching hundreds of communities around the country uh, that were following a cradle to career model. We started with trying to figure out what are they doing? How are they doing this work? How are they mobilizing it? Uh, we looked specifically into the Strive Together Network and Lumina Foundation's talent hubs. So beginning in 2021, Dr. Kwiatkowski brought to our attention, and when I say we, just know that I mean the community, Cradle to Career Muncie, it's not just we, it's everybody, um, an opportunity to apply for a Promise Neighborhood grant through the U.S. Department of Education, which is a $30 million grant opportunity. The Promise Neighborhood grant is modeled after the amazing work of Jeffrey Canada in Harlem, New York, and where he stated that every child in Harlem would graduate with a post-secondary degree, and he started with one block, and now they're on block 97. Uh, the Promise Neighborhood application really forced us to research and start digging into data, specifically census tracts data. 
And in 2021, we submitted our Promise Neighborhood application in partnership with Muncie Community Schools, Ball State University, and numerous community partners. And even though we did not receive the $30 million, uh, if I had to pinpoint the one thing that really started this work, it was that, it was that application. It really made us dig into the data, create a plan, and that's what catapulted the work forward. Uh, we had an opportunity to apply again in 2022 for a Promise Neighborhood application. Uh, we did not receive it again, uh, but we did receive a high score. Uh, but again, it forced us as a community to think through the process, add to the plan, and, and work our plan. Um, I also just wanted to highlight a couple other lessons we've learned along the way. Uh, we use the saying, you probably heard us before, but we use data as a flashlight and not a hammer. And what we mean with that, we have to understand the reality of the situation, and we have to have baseline data to be able to measure our progress. Um, we also have learned you have to have the courage to talk about disaggregated data. It's not always pretty, but it's extremely important to understand. Okay, so the next slide, uh, this one, when I talk about cradle to career, just know that we didn't make this up. You know, we study lots of communities around the country and we're just kind of following their model. And so we borrowed from other countries, or sorry, other communities on their great work and their important work on cradle to career. Cradle to career work here in Muncie and Delaware County is just a piece of a larger cradle to career puzzle. So I just wanted to show you this visual. So here in Delaware County in Muncie, we have local initiatives focused on educational attainment from birth to, birth to career, cradle to career. And then at the regional level, there is a group, the East Central Indiana Talent Collaborative. Um, they are working in regional coalitions focused on birth to five, kindergarten through eighth grade, high school, and adult and higher education. And then at the state level, um, the Indiana Department of Ed, they now have a data dashboard that spans from pre-K through career. So they're also following a cradle to career model. And then I'd mentioned Strive Together before. Um, Strive Together is a national organization. It's a community of, of, of uh, communities around the country that are uh, following a cradle to career model. Uh, there are 70 organizations around the country that are members of Strive Together Network, and Muncie is the only Strive Together member in the state of Indiana. Uh, this is huge because we have opportunities for coaching and learning from others that have been doing this work longer than us. And um, we're also learning that we have stories and successes that we can share with other communities as well. So that's been exciting. All right, so the next slide, I'm just gonna take you through some fast facts. Uh, please feel free to shout them out if you know. So um, what percentage of brain development happens by five? Does anybody know? 90, thank you, Missy, our kindergarten readiness guru here. <laughs> you got it. 90% of brain development happens by age five. That's pretty amazing to think about. Those first five years are so incredibly important. Um, as of 2020, what percentage of jobs require an individual to have a high-level certificate or degree? Anybody know that one? It's quiet. Oh, sorry. 60%. So by 2020, 60% of jobs now require a high-level certificate or degree. So it's, it's basically saying in the 21st century, the secret to a living wage employment is educational attainment. Okay, the next one is what percentage of Muncie experiences higher than average challenges such as poverty, low wages, high occurrence of single parenthood, and low educational attainment? 40%? Actually, 75%. 75% of Muncie is experiencing those challenges. And what percentage of mothers giving birth in Delaware County are on Medicaid? Fifty-one percent. Fifty-one percent of mothers giving birth in Delaware County are on Medicaid. And the last one, and you kind of had a, a precursor to it with IYI's presentation, but what is the number one factor that predicts how long someone will live? Thank you. You got it. <laughs> it's zip code. And so the zip code, based on social determinants of health that was mentioned earlier, um, that takes into account socioeconomic status, education, neighborhood, physical environment, employment, social support networks, and access to health care. Uh, this map represents the city of Muncie. The red lines are the census tracts. 
The purple lines are the elementary school district lines, and the purple dots represent the physical locations of Muncie Community School school buildings. And using Robert Wood Johnson's foundation life expectancy calculator, you can go to their website, you can put in any, any address in the United States, uh, you will discover that there is about a 13-year life expectancy difference between Southview Elementary compared to Northview Elementary. There's an even bigger gap when you compare Southview Elementary to census tracts in northern Delaware County, which is about 17-year life expectancy. And the, this map represents um, the state of Indiana, and this was shared with us by Dr. Box at the state, Indiana State Department of Health. Um, this represents perinatal high-risk areas. Peri, perinatal high-risk areas are assessed using stable infant mortality rates, percentages of women smoking during pregnancy, percentages of preterm and low-term or low birth weight births, and sewage rates. The yellow represents high priority counties, and you can see East Central Indiana is like the only cluster of counties on this, in the state. Um, the blue represents high priority zip codes, and about nine high priority zip codes, 47302 in Muncie is one of those high priority zip codes. So where are children living in poverty? Um, this is the 2021 American Community Survey. Just know that these numbers change every year. Um, so they look a little different when you look at, at the data. But the point of this slide is to show that students are experiencing poverty and living in poverty everywhere in Delaware County. But when you look at the data, Muncie has the highest number of children living in poverty. And this does not include the Alice Family Data, which stands for the Asset Limited Income Constraint Employed. If you add that data in, these numbers would be higher. Following an equity approach for Cradle to Career Muncie, we're focused on Muncie first, and we hope that the work that happens in Muncie impacts the entire county. And just know we even have members involved in Cradle to Career Muncie that work at other school corporations. So it is all of us working together. So you've heard me talk a little bit about the promised neighborhoods. So this is this represents the physical location of the, what we reference as the promised neighborhood. And just know the promised neighborhood represents tremendous opportunities. That's why it's a promised neighborhood. Uh, the map shows the physical locations of the promised neighborhoods, which are the neighborhoods surrounding Longfellow Elementary, East Washington Academy, Grissom Elementary, and Southview Elementary. And this also represents that 75% fact that was mentioned earlier. So how will we positively change the future of Muncie? by adding equitable and sufficient supports to the promised neighborhood that provides a pipeline of support from cradle to career. So this one talks through, poverty has caused a tidal wave of community challenges, including poor health outcomes, low quality of life, high un and underemployment that affect the majority of our neighbors. Educational attainment from cradle to career is the most effective strategy at our disposal that is proven to help neighbors and community overcome challenges posed by poverty. Just know it's also educational attainment, not only educational attainment, but it's mentorship and parental involvement. The research out there, mentorship, and the research showing parental involvement is one of the greatest predictor for student success. Um, and then by doing this, how are we going to do its collective impact, which brings people and organizations from various sectors together around a common goal, and um, that is the method that will make us successful. This one just walks through again. So in disadvantaged neighborhoods, barriers make it challenging for children to learn, grow, and succeed. With such complex challenges, solitary one-off programs struggle to move the needle on economic mobility. The problems are complex, the solutions require a community-wide effort, and this is where collective impact comes into play. No single organization can do this work alone. It takes all of us working together. And in our community, we have numerous and wonderful and many programs and initiatives happening, but imagine the impact that would happen by aligning our work towards a common goal. The next slide is a shocking statistic and also part of the motivation behind this work of Cradle to Career. Uh, pro you probably hear us say this one a lot too if you've been to a lot of our meetings. Um, but a child is awake approximately 6,000 hours a year and about 1,000 of those hours are spent in school. The other 5,000 are hours spent with family and community. And just know that the 1,000 hours is based off of perfect attendance. And we know attendance is a struggle now. 
So how children spend those 5,000 hours matters, and this is where the community has a role to play. Uh, the, work of, the work of Cradle to Career is to enhance the learning that's happening at the schools, not to add work to the schools. It's to take some of that weight off and support and share that responsibility. So schools cannot do it alone. Also within Cradle to Career, uh, the work of it is based on, or the core foundation is based on results-based accountability. And results-based account accountability, in a nutshell here, uh, we walk you through five questions. And so we talked about the importance of data earlier. So the number one is, what are we doing? What does the data tell us? So we have to know, what is the data? Number two is, what is the story behind the curve? I always say this is my favorite, because you got to really dive into that data and understand what's the reason behind it, you know, what's the story behind it. Then the third step is, who are the partners who have a role to play in turning the curve? Who needs to be at the table? Everybody. And what works to turn the curve? Um, what are some research and evidence-based practices, promising approaches around the country that are working to move the needle on what we're trying to do here? And then what is our action plan to turn the curve? So coming up with our own implementation plan. And the reason it is a circle is that it's continuous and we're just working through that continuous improvement model. So always evaluating, making sure that what we're doing is the best strategy and the best fit. All right, the next slide is the Cradle to Career framework. And uh, this kind of just walks you through what are we doing in Muncie and how are we doing it? And just so you know, that the work truly begins from ages zero to five. So you can see up here on the, on the chart or on the screens here uh, that we have kindergarten readiness as our first marker, but just know that, that work starts zero to five. And the ultimate goal is for prosperous families and individuals and communities. In between, we're advocating for and focus on educational attainment, pathways to successful careers, and living wage jobs. And so the framework goes, we're using Muncie Community Schools' strategic and innovation plans as our core guiding documents, and then the George and Francis Ball Foundation is serving as the backbone organization for Cradle to Career. And then we are led by a Cradle to Career leadership table. And if you don't mind, if you are on the leadership table, would you raise your hand if you're in the audience? Would you just raise your hand if you're on the leadership table? And you can look around so you can see who's involved there. I'm going to have other members raise your hand, so be ready. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, so then getting into the Collaborative Action Networks, or CANs. You probably have heard us talk about CANs before, but Collaborative Action Networks, or CANs. And CANs are a network of individuals and organizations that are convening around a common goal. And within those cans, we are following the RBA practices, we are setting goals, we're developing strategies, we're implementing strategies, evaluating the strategies, and that continuous improvement model. And so the first collaborative action network is our kindergarten readiness can, led by By5 and Missy Modisit. If you are involved in the kindergarten readiness can, will you please raise your hand? The group can see. Thank you. Okay, the second one, third grade reading can, led by Jenny Marsh and United Way. If you are part of the third grade reading can, will you raise your hand? Thank you. The middle grade math can, led by Ted Baker, Innovation Connector. If you're part of the middle grade math can, will you raise your hand? Thank you. The high school graduation can, led by Dr. Leanne Kwiatkowski and the Muncie Community Schools. If you're part of the high school graduation can, will you please raise your hand? Thank you. And the post-secondary success can, led by Jeff Scott and his team at Ivy Tech. If you're part of the post-secondary success can, will you please raise your hand? Nobody? <laughs> it's okay. We'll get you involved. And then career employment, led by Tracy Lutton and Elizabeth Rowray, and they are getting ready to implement and get started with the career uh, employment can. So if you're interested in getting involved with that, there's ways you can connect. And then um, the education supports and community supports. So also the markers along the academic piece. Um, just know, again, we did not make these markers up. The reason that we use these markers from kindergarten readiness through career employment is because there's baseline data that, data that can be compared across the country and see how we're comparing to other communities. 
And so in the education support group, we have Jenny Smithson at Muncie Community Schools leading the social emotional learning can. If you're involved in the social emotional learning can, will you raise your hand? Thank you. And then for the internet and devices, just know we do not have a standalone can for internet and devices, but again, it's just infused into the work. Um, we heard earlier from the IYI team um, how important internet and um, access to internet and equipment and being able to use access being able to use properly the internet and this, the equipment is so important. And we really saw that heightened during 2020 when students were working from home. And then getting into the community and family supports. We have a wraparound supports can led by United Way and Jenny Marsh as well. That will be starting soon. There'll be, so if you're interested in getting involved in wraparound supports. We also have the family community engagement can led by Chad Zouch and his team at the YMCA. If you are a member of the Family Community Engagement Can, will you please raise your hand? Thank you. And then we have a Health Can led by Brian Ayers and Open Door. And again, we haven't gotten the Health Can up and going yet, but it will be soon. And so if you're interested in getting involved in health, and again, tying it with the IYI health data earlier, um, the importance of that. And then equity, again, is not a standalone can, but it is infused into all of the work of Cradle to Career. All right, and this is just a slide, a visual representation of the organizations involved in Cradle to Career Muncie. Um, and you saw numerous hands raised throughout the presentation. So again, thank you for your participation and being involved in this movement. Um, again, none of this work would be possible without collective impact. No single organization can do this work alone. And people like you in this room and your expertise is how we are truly going to make change within our community. So we need you, and there's lots of ways that you can engage. Um, if you're interested in learning more, there are actually two opportunities coming up. So in this QR code, if you use your phone and take a picture of it, um, it will take you to sign up for these events. So on Thursday, eight, on Thursday May 4th, uh, we have our new quarterly power hours. And the power hours were developed uh, from input from our CAN members, wanting to know what are other CANs doing um, what are strategies kindergarten readiness is working on? So I want to know, if I'm in kindergarten readiness can, then I want to know what's going on in post-secondary. And so uh, it's just a, it's a strictly networking hour to mingle and get ideas from others and talk with people and network and, and all of that. So it should be a lot of fun. We do a couple um, big updates, about 15 minutes, and that's it. If you can't get enough, then, if you're sitting here like, man, I really want to get involved, there is a deep dive new partner orientation from 3.30 to 4.30. So the hour before the power hour from 4.30 to 5.30, um, we do a deep dive into the data, looking at school data, community data, um, talk about a lot of the things that we talked about today, but really getting into that disaggregated data as well. Um, so if you are interested, that QR code will lead you to signing up. And so I'd like to leave you with a quote before I turn it over, but each one of us can make a difference. Together we can make a change, and we truly believe that, and we're seeing the impact of this collective impact strategy and work happening now, but it will truly take all of us working together. So again, thank you. Uh, please reach out anytime if you have any questions or you would like any additional information. My, my email's up there. Like, if you just want to get into more data or learn more, please, by all means, please feel free to contact me. And that is it. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the one and only Jenny Marsh, CEO of the Heart of Indiana United Way. Thank you, Courtney. Great, great overview of Cradle to Career Muncie. Now we're going to delve into one of those collective action networks. Uh, that United Way has been uh, working on and leading, but we've had a lot of transition in the last 10 years. I started 10 years ago, and we were just United Way of Delaware County, and then Henry County joined us, and Randolph County joined us, and super excited to say that the fabulous United Way of Madison County, which also served Fayette County, uh, merged with us last year. And so we became the heart of Indiana United Way, and um, just thrilled, thrilled with that development. Um, if you're not familiar with United Way, 
Uh, they vary by county and community. There are about 1,200 of us in the world. And for the reason that they, they are so varied is because they need to reflect the communities that they serve. They identify and prioritize emerging human service and that are service needs that are community-wide. Uh, annually, we fundraise and we raise those dollars and those donor dollars are put together and invested in the programs and initiatives and partnerships that are gonna move the needle and turn the trajectory of communities. So people's lives are improved and our communities are made stronger. How our heart of Indiana United Way works is we first seek to understand. We listen to and learn from our community members. And when your goal is super critical and, and systems changing, you want to make sure you're listening to the people that you most want to help and impact. You want to make sure that you're working with them, not doing things to and for them. And so our listen and learn sessions based on the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation have really been helpful in helping us identify our funding priorities and how we work. Uh, we began listening to and learning from community members here in Delaware County, and we heard families want the best for their kids. We all know that, right? We want the best for the children in our lives. Um, some folks were not very confident that they could identify the things they needed to do to get the best for their children because of their life circumstances. Um, everybody uh, wanted to make sure that there were better employment opportunities. There were concerns for the schools. Just lots of things that, that families really wished for, but education just kept coming to the top. We pair that public knowledge that we capture in those, in those listening sessions with expert data and research. What are the promising practices that are really moving the needles in other communities? What does the data tell us? And how do we kind of understand those two things synergistically? Um, we learned about the impacts of um, grade level reading, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but if you didn't know, third grade reading is super important because that's the year a student transitions from learning how to read into being a student who reads to learn. And if you don't make that transition, then you start, start struggling in other subjects in school and risk falling behind, right? So we built a... Whoop, we built a coalition of about 30 partners initially that were coming to the table consistently and we'd talk about what are the barriers to success, how do we build capacity, uh, what gaps are there in services, where might we need to try to bridge some of those gaps, and um, we even jumped into some direct service work, which United Ways typically don't do. We grant money, we convene coalitions, but we did some direct service work because at the time, the principal at Longfellow Elementary said, United Way, we've got this amazing program, MP3. It's fantastic, but nearly half of my students didn't pass. I read it was like the inaugural test year. How can you help? Well, we can bring volunteers in for some of those high dosage tutoring sessions to do a, a reading club after school. We can do some book distribution programs. We can do lots of things. So we started doing some direct service work with the schools. And then we became um, the, the sponsor for Muncie in the national campaign for grade level reading. So we were reporting up to the national campaign for grade level reading on the work we were doing. And one of the things that was most important was this coalition helped us set a goal that by 2024, all third graders would be reading at grade level. And as we saw, we're, we're missing the mark a little bit. But it was really important for us to set a goal that was highly aspirational and highly ambitious. And some exciting things started happening because of that. Of the 200 communities that were reporting to the National Campaign for, for Grade Level Reading, Muncie was recognized with Pace Setter Honors um, twice. Uh, <laughs> In 2015, those students at Longfellow with MP3, with volunteers, with all the many programs really focusing in on grade level reading for that school, 82% of the kiddos passed I read that year. So that was a huge yay Longfellow. The other thing we were recognized for in 2015 was the creation of the Buy Five initiative. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of folks that work on that, and the, the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading recognized that that was a really uh, great best practice and how it was being organized and structured. So, yay, Buy Five, that was awesome. And then in 2018, we got uh, recognized for being a bright spot in the Campaign for Grade Level Reading by pairing students from the Indiana Academy 
for sciences, humanities, and mathematics. These high ability high school students were coming into Southview Elementary School and doing some high dosage tutoring at the end of the day and that was, that was uh, recognized and celebrated. Um, but you know, while those, those awards were kind of a pat on the back and kind of a keep on going and put some wind in our sails, we really struggled. We had some staffing changes. Um, we had some coalition fatigue. You know, when you keep convening people to talk, sometimes it's hard to kind of keep focused and keep moving forward. And so we just really um, waffled, just, just candidly. And so we really decided it was time to take a step back and go back to our listen and learn and really, again, listen to families about what they hoped for their children's education. And we heard concern that the children enjoy reading, not just that they read at grade level, but they like to do it. Uh, they had concerns about community engagement and how to make that happen. Um, and we also revamped how we structured the coalition and we recruited executive directors to come to the table because those folks can say, hey, I release my staff to do X, Y, and Z. And so we brought out of school learning partners, health partners, Muncie community schools, Muncie public libraries. We brought leaders from Ball State, multiple folks coming to the table. Um, to, to help us kind of listen to the community again and make sure that was really embedded in the work we were doing. And then Tom Kinghorn came to see me and talked about this great new strategy of George and Francis Ball Foundation. And he said, United Way, will you help lead the third grade can? And I said, I would have my feelings hurt if you didn't ask us to help with this work. Um, so yes, of course I will, Tom. Um, it's hard to tell Mr. Kinghorn no. And um, wraparound supports was also you know, a natural thing for United Way to do because we do a lot of things to help families meet their basic needs. and and help those um, working uh, families that are really struggling to meet their basic budget, um, you know, they've got significant challenges too. So it's a natural pairing, right? And that, that impacts the whole Cradle to Career continuum. So we are very, very proud to be a part of Cradle to Career Muncie. And just as it seemed like all the stars were aligning, we had all this new great public knowledge. MCS was being led by the phenomenal Leanne Kwiatkowski and her team. Ball State's fully invested and involved. We've got all these great leaders. We are ready to go. Something happened in 2020, and those challenges that our families had been facing were exas exacerbated um, exponentially. I mean, just horrifically. But it gave us greater determination and greater grit to protect every child's right to read. So our third grade uh, collective action network leaders have recently drilled down and really come up with strategies, again, looking at the public knowledge and the data. And they have organized their work inspired by Philadelphia. If you've never visited Read by Fourth or Promise, uh, readingpromise.org, um, I would recommend you check them out. They're doing phenomenal things. So they inspired a lot of the way we looked at this. Um, but we reorganized our work, putting families at the center, making sure families understand and embrace their roles in raising readers, that communities and neighborhoods support literacy outcomes, and that systems are equitably designed and prepared to sustainably support literacy outcomes. So this uh, CAN um, is calling together all of Muncie's families, community members, systems leaders to connect, align, and bring transformative ideas to life. And families and communities and systems are united to increase brain development from ages newborn to three. Yes, 90% happens before kindergarten, 75% happens before the age of three. So let's, let's really focus on those first three years and let's ensure school readiness by age five and improve school attendance and get them in there for those full thousand hours, right? And empower quality reading education, especially through kindergarten through third grade, so it's transitioning into comprehension. And let's embolden out of school learning. 
Within our Collective Action Network, we are currently organizing three task forces. So here is my ask of you. Uh, these are programs and initiatives that will measure our success toward the following goals. And our family engagement folks are going to remind families of their power by sharing resources that promote literacy at home and in everyday moments. They're going to help families understand and embrace their role in raising readers through play-based learning, Where's Sydney Burkdahl? I saw her. Woohoo, Sydney. Yes, play based learning. Those home libraries, we're going to build them. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, it's growing, y'all. It's coming. We're going to help families and children enjoy reading together in places they wait. Ball State University built some beautiful book nooks that are being installed across or have been installed across places like laundromats and doctor's offices, stocked with resources for families. And we're increasing access to books 24-7, thanks to By Five's Little Free Libraries Network. And we're improving school attendance. Whoop, wrong way. Community mobilization is going to really support families as they embrace their role uh, raising readers. So our community mobilization efforts all about building literacy-rich neighborhoods and communities through volunteer engagement, the Reading Captains Program, Learning Happens Everywhere initiatives. And last but not least, definitely wrapping around all of that are our systems. We've got to make sure our systems are equitably designed and better prepared to sustainably support literacy outcomes. So this task force is going to fuel systems change and support early language and literacy success. Um, they're going to do this through teacher preparation and support advocating for the science of reading, amplifying classroom teachers' experiences and insights, and providing reading supports that help mitigate learning loss and challenges that hang over us from COVID. So as you can see in this playbook, <laughs> through this reorganized and concentrated effort, every single person has a role to play in protecting our children's right to read. And if you'd like to be a part of this, this is my contact information. I strongly encourage you to give me a call, email me. Uh, we would love to have you on one of the task forces. And it is now my pleasure to introduce one of the greatest Shiro's Muncie has, uh, not only the leader of the YWCA, but she is also a leader at Muncie Community Schools serving on the school board with Tasha Barnes Griffin. So you've had a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of interesting facts. Some were disheartening to me, and I'm sure some of you as well. But some of it is also encouraging. But I love to be a part of the State of the Child Committee because I get to help them select someone from our community to bring all these numbers to human form. And so I have that pleasure this morning to introduce you to uh, Ms. Faith Surf. And before I bring her to the lectern, I want to share a little bit about Faith. Faith Surf is an exceptional, passionate educator who has an uncanny way of seeing the greatness within every student she serves. She recognizes the importance of connecting with families and communities and works in partnership with them to help create a village where all children can dream, grow, and thrive. As master teacher for Longfellow Elementary School in Muncie, Indiana, Ms. Surf is an amazing and accomplished school leader. She comes alongside her building principal, Mr. Gary Moore, to offer innovative, cutting-edge supports, goal-setting ideas, and evaluation tools specific to the needs of Longfellow Elementary School. Ms. Surf utilizes data to assist the teachers in their daily reading and math planning. I feel short. The data informs classroom instruction, and it is used to create individual student pullout plans. She engages as well as partners with parents, families, and community members to give leadership to social, emotional, and extra academic supports, such as the DEN, school, the DEN, which is a school community mentoring program. She also meets with parents and families on a regular basis, offering an open heart, a listening ear, and solid guidance. Ms. Surf's life is a sacrifice of love. If working in school day education is not enough, she also co-teaches 
in the Muncie P3 after school academic enrichment program. Ms. Surf extends her day to guide a group of third grade students toward the goal of reaching at grade level by the end of third grade and math proficiency. She is also the curriculum coordinator for the after school program. She helps the staff of Muncie P3 to create and develop enrichment activities that are considered to be a hands-on, fun learning experience. Mrs. Cerf holds her bachelor's and master's degree in elementary education from Ball State University. She has been an educator with Muncie Community Schools for 30 years. Faith is the wife of Mr. Jonathan Cerf, and together they have four children. All four children attended Muncie Community Schools. Isaiah is a current Muncie Central High School senior. Jonathan and Brianna both have graduated from Ball State. And Macy is a current Ball State University student who is pursuing a degree in elementary education. Chirp, chirp! <laughs> Overall, Ms. Surf says her passion and calling is to provide educators, parents, families, and communities with inspiration, and the resources to encourage them to grow and to always seek new knowledge so that they become the best that they can be. Ms. Surf believes that all children possess the necessary tools to become their own greatest dream. And that is Faith's Calling, to help students recognize and use their skills so that it all works together for every student's good. Please join me in welcoming Faith Surf to the lectern. I have to say that I speak my greatest with kids. <laughs> so this is new for me, but I am thankful that I'm here today um, just to share a little bit about our journey. So before I begin, I want to put on my parent hat for just a little bit. Um, well, Tasha has already introduced you to my kids, but I want to give you a little bit more insight. Because before I became a Muncie community, I'm sorry, a master teacher, um, my students, my children, my children um, attended a lot of Whiteley Community um, and Beaulieu Center activities. Sorry, I gotta catch my breath. <laughs> um, and, but in Motivate Our Minds and Beaulieu Center were centers that provided great programming that brought my children many opportunities to shape themselves into the beings that they are today. And as she said, my students are thriving and I'm thankful for that. Brianna did receive a lot of support from Motivate Our Minds when she was a child and they helped her to develop academic skills, as well as helping her to find out that she really has a gift to reach kids. And so because of that, she is currently working for Muncie Community Schools as a fifth grade teacher at Westville Elementary School. And my son, Jonathan, went to Moms. And Moms, um, well, it was Mary Dollison. Um, <laughs> and if you know Mary, you know, you know Mary. And Mary was someone that looked at Jonathan and said, wow, he really is a fanatic, a, a phenomenal student who loves nature. And so she encouraged us to get him involved with the Boy Scouts of America. And it was a 12-year journey for us all. <laughs> um, but he did reach the level of Eagle Scout. And she promised us that if he could make that scout, if he can become an Eagle Scout, he will have doors opening up for him left and right. And so upon graduation from Ball State, he is now currently working for Boys and Girl Scouts of America as an executive director. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Macy went to Moms, and at Moms, she received academic support, and she also received exposure to theater and dance. Macy then later went on to the Bewley Center where she was under Andrea Evans Gross, and she participated in competitive dance. Um, her experiences led her to become a youth leader at our home church, where she leads a liturgical dance team and a choir. She is also a co-founder of a youth leadership team at Ball State University, where she's a junior studying education. And she is currently working with the MP3 after school program, because all of my kids do, <laughs> um, as a co-teacher for her second grade classroom. 
And then I have Isaiah, who is now getting ready to graduate, but he went through the MP3 program as a small child, so he did not attend mom's. Um, but he received numerous opportunities to figure out how to dream and dream big. And because of that, we are ready to get him prepared to go off to a college of his choice. So for, uh, when you think about my four students, just to put it in a little bit of perspective, one of the four was not a great test taker. But can you figure out which one? You can't. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened because they attended after school programming right inside of Whiteley Community, um, Whiteley Community and the attended White, Muncie Community Schools. The, I am so proud that Muncie Community Schools and Whiteley joined with us, my family, in helping to prepare my kids for their greater tomorrow. So that was my family. <laughs> so when I think about being a master teacher, now it's got to be my new hat. Data truly has become a driving force inside our school because it helps us to make better decisions for our building. Last year, we began looking at our local data to support teachers' instruction and students' learning. We utilized the iReady benchmark data that is assessed three times a year, and it's an assessment tool that closely aligns with the high-stakes assessments. If our students are performing at grade level or above in iReady, then it's a pretty good indicator that they'll perform well on the IRE 3 assessment and the iLearn assessment. Another important feature about that program is that it allows us to make instructional decisions on behalf of our students between those benchmarks. So under the direction of Mr. Moore, Gary Moore, we focused on understanding our students and we wanted to focus on our students at a much deeper level than just a student sitting on a roster inside a classroom that they were assigned to. In order for our students to be able to reach the expectations of those high stakes assessments, we had to figure out a way of how to reach the students, not only academically, but socially and emotionally as well. So, we as a teaching community had to address three issues that could have been hindering our data growth. One was teacher needs. We have to, we have to think about what, is, what did they have and what didn't they have, and we had to think about our students' needs. And then we had to think about community support. At Longfellow, we have this mantra that says, one vision, one team, one goal. And that goal being that we wanted to provide our students with access to a well-rounded education. As educators, we had to ask ourselves those hard questions, like what is effective teaching? Am I being effective? And what do we need as facilitators to make sure that we reach all of our students? Well, our teacher said, they needed strong classroom support or assistance because they wanted to drive down their large classrooms into small groups so that they can directly address student needs. They also said we wanted discipline support which, uh, with expectations that when expectations weren't being met to restore a sense of community back into their classroom because we want our classrooms to feel like home. We want our classrooms to feel like a place where I can grow and thrive. We want our classrooms to feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. So we wanted to be able to bring that back when things go awry. They also needed a vision that provided all of us with a purpose for what we do each and every day, as well as what we want to know and be able, or want our students to know and be able to do. So with that, we wanted to motivate our teachers. And so we created a school vision that we use every Tuesday in my office space when we gather for PLCs. And it says, in the pursuit of wisdom, the students of Longfellow Elementary School will discover something of value inside of themselves and return it back to society. Our school will provide a safe, aesthetically pleasing, functional environment conducive to learning and development of self-esteem. So everything that we do and think, everything that we feel, has to be grounded in that community. Um, vision. And so sometimes when my teachers come into my office for their collaboration, I plug out in the pursuit of the student and I say in the pursuit of the teacher because we're still growing and learning too. We're a working community that says we will get there together, but we got to figure out why and how. So we also crafted a student pledge because the data says our students have to be charged too. And so in that student pledge, we did the, um, the student pledge, it was to provide students with a focus on self, 
because we want them to think and reflect about themselves first. We wanted to set standards for behavioral outcomes that we desire for our student population. They have to know what is the boundaries. And we have to give our students the opportunity to take on ownership of their own learning where they can see their efforts to grow themselves becomes the fuel for their future success. We want them in charge. They are in charge of their learning. We are in charge of providing the instruction. Together we will get there <laughs> and we're excited. Even though this data really makes me take a deep breath, we're excited. The student pledge was designed to allow our students to understand that they have an importance. So the pledge says, I am ready to be the best me I can be. I am responsible for my actions and my words. I meet the expectations that, set, that are set for my classroom throughout and throughout the building. I will manage my behavior at all times. I am respectful to adults and my peers. I make every effort to follow the Longfellow rules in the classroom, in the hallway, in the restroom, in the cafeteria, and on the playground, and wherever I am. <laughs> So, with that being said, when we meet with our, our students and we go through the pledge and they sign it and they set goals, we focus on the words, I am responsible for my actions and my words. I'm responsible for what I say and what I do. And if we can empower them to do those two things, my voice is wobbly, I'm sorry. When we can do those two things, then one, they're automatically respectful of adults and their peers. And two, they're ready to be the best me that they can be. So the vision statement and the pledge has turned many moments of struggle into true learning experiences where students and staff find common grounds where they can choose to grow from it together. With our learning spaces primed for social and emotional learning, the students are able to find purpose for academic learning. Our data shows that we had to build student and teacher relationships to reduce office referrals, so that we can increase student learning opportunities. But the final and most important, and I actually get excited about this piece, so I hope my voice doesn't get any more wobbly than this, <laughs> is that we had to address this year our community support and, or our village, because it really does take a village. And so we spent this year reconnecting with the surrounding communities and letting them know that we needed them. And guess what? The community embraced us right back. Between the volunteers and the multiple vested programs in our school community, we have begun to pour back into our students. They have aligned their programming with our school benchmark data, so we're moving in the same direction, um, to guide their support. For our teachers, we partnered with Ball State University, with Dr. Stefanski, who is our BSU liaison, and she's currently working with us to enhance our literacy and writing block, because we want to improve as teachers. We're still growing, too. Um, I am working closely with her to plan frequent professional learning communities for our teachers to continue learning and growing along with the follow-up support to make sure that the new learning is being transferred back into, the, into their classrooms. <clears throat> we also have Dr. Hong, who is working with us and our students in the area of mathematics. She is providing us support in making math culturally relevant for our young scholars in grades three through five. We have to know why math is important. But for our students, we launched a lot of initiatives, and this is the exciting part, <laughs> is that for our students, um, their data exposed to us their needs, and our partners, community partners, came willing to stand in the gaps with us. We do have Read United, and we're excited about them, that it's a program organized by United Way, and they're working with us to help our current third graders meet um, third graders in the area of literacy. This is a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session that is occurring, occurring twice a month, twice, sorry, twice a week, and they are, con they are committed to helping our third graders to become proficient readers by the end of third grade. But we also have a DEN program, and this DEN program is a mentoring program that mentors students socially, emotionally, and academically. The DEN program is overseen by Mr. Ernest Brown, our family engagement coordinator. Mr. Brown is really focused on helping our students to grow strong relationships between students, families, and staff. He is committed to building bridges between our worlds. The volunteers in the DEN consist of the Whiteley Community Council members, our surrounding churches like Union and Antioch, and Life Touch Ministries. We also have Motivator Minds pouring into our building. 
Um, and they are supporting our first graders weekly, and they're focusing on remediating those literacy skills because our first graders are a group of kids that struggled through COVID. And then we have Future Readers. It's an online reading program that is grounded in the science of reading. They are supporting our most at-risk first and second graders this year, and they're helping us to build their reading foundational skills. Our data also encouraged us to develop yet another re um, relationship, and we're currently uh, working with BSU Ed Reading for 30 teacher um, a professor, Dr. Rebecca Brown, and she's providing remediation services for our kindergarten, first and second. We know we have gaps, and we are purposely trying to directly impact those gaps by helping, by having people outside come in and help fill those up. So they're remediating our students in reading and math twice a week. Then we have MP3, um, our after school program that's directed by Michael Young Long. This program promises families that if they partner with us, we can help their child to be proficient in reading by the end of third grade. We spend time not only pushing academic success, but also helping the young child to dream about their tomorrow. We educate them on community, careers, colleges, and citizenship. We need the whole child to see themselves being successful right inside their community. By the end of third grade, we want to produce solid leaders that believe in helping others, that, that believe in helping others reach their dreams while they are still continuing to climb. And lastly, we have one more program, which is the after school program called Extreme, and it's servicing our fourth and fifth graders. They provide um, one semester of STEM learning each year. They attend Ball State University twice a week for STEM coursework. Many of those students were, future, were past um, students from the MP3 after school program. So I asked you, how do you think these supports have, have affected our data in iReady? Well, in the winter of 2022, we made a 51% growth on our mid-year benchmark in reading, and we made a 41% growth in math and as, as part of a partial year. And as a school, we are working toward doubling our data by the end of the school year. So we're pushing forward with all the supports that have been offered to us, along with our teachers and our families being re-engaged to make sure that each child has the opportunity to show what they know. So at Longfellow, we are all focused on utilizing that local data to support student learning. Our students are learning to problem solve and embrace the productive struggle. COVID really caused them to stop thinking. We gotta get them moving again. They are beginning to understand the importance of taking on ownership of their own learning, Students are beginning to track their own successes and celebrating one another's efforts. The data presented today reflects important information that we will continue to use to drive our instruction, but what it doesn't reflect is the community commitment, stu individual student growth, and teacher improvement that has occurred to springboard us toward reaching potential goals, uh, the, reaching or exceeding the potential expectations of some of the high stakes assessments. This year has been motivating and inspiring because of our community and funders that are willing to get into the trenches with us for the sake of all students. At Longfellow, we claim that this is our year. We say that all the time, this is our year. <laughs> um, and as far as our date, our overarching data is concerned, we, will st we still have room to grow, we understand that. But at Longfellow, we have embraced the idea that we can't write a ship overnight. But with the right vision, a strong, su solid student pledge, community and funders, support, and a committed staff, we can keep our ship moving one stroke at a time. Our data may say not yet, but at Longfellow, we say we're coming. Thank you. Wow, we can see why you are a master teacher, Faith. So could you join me in giving another round of applause for Faith? All right, so you've, you've heard a lot today. You've learned a lot. You've hopefully reinforced some of the things that you already knew. We know you learned today that, that children represent just about 26% of our state's population. We at IYI often follow that up by saying they also represent 100% of our future. 
And so making these investments today, doing this work today, is going to pay off for years and years to come. So we want to, one, here, I'm going to give you a couple logistics, and then I'm going to give you a couple challenges, and they're all going to be quick. So one, please take the survey. Let us know what you learned today, what went well, what we need to do differently. We are constantly, I guarantee you, that the steering committee is already thinking about next year and what we want to do the same, what we want to do differently. So please let us know. Secondarily, if you are one of those youth-serving organizations that is planning to apply for Lilly Endowment Strengthening Youth Programs Initiative, which if you haven't heard about it, it's a $45 million investment in youth-serving organizations, which is coupled with a $91 million investment that the endowment already made to affiliated organizations, which will be followed by a $20 million investment in individual youth worker well-being for a total of over $155 million that the endowment is investing in youth services in our state. It is an incredible time to be part of this work. It is an incredible time to think about what else we can do and to amplify. So we will have a clinic right after this. If you are, if you're applying for that, please stay. We'll, we'll, there'll be some great training and some assistance there. Now, your challenges. First of all, the data is here to validate. We want this to be an external validation of the work you're already doing. So there's already great work. We heard that. We've heard it today. We heard it from Courtney. We heard it from Jenny. We heard it from Natasha. And we heard it from Faith. Turn to somebody next to you and say, good job. Thank you. We're, we're doing good stuff. <laughs> So it's important to do that, right? When we're thinking about opportunities, we often think about what next. I'm an achiever mindset. If any of you do Strength Quest, I'm always thinking what else. But we need to stop and celebrate what we're already doing. So make sure you're thanking each other. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. This work is a marathon. We are talking about laying plans for years and years and years to come. You heard it even with Faith's own family, that, that making and those successes were years in the making. So take some respite, take care of yourself on the journey. Also, before you leave, you can do it silently, you can write it down, whatever works for you. Think about what you heard today. What opportunity sparked your interest? As you heard, there's, there's data, and it can either get us kind of stuck in place or it can compel us forward. You heard for folks, again, talking about how excited they are about what's next, what's going on, where we're headed, where this community is headed. There is something special going on in Muncie. You all know that. It's important that you know that folks, when we come to visit, we see it and we feel it and we celebrate it with you. So think about, think about, please, what else you can do, what opportunities you've seen, and let us know how IY can help you. Thanks so much for being here and have a great day.